Hello, everybody. Happy Friday night. Um, this is Dee with the Unplugged Grief Ministries podcast. I'm glad that you are here with us tonight. And we have a special guest. Um, you originally from Australia, right? I am, yeah. Born in Australia. Uh, that's another country I want to go visit. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to say it real quick. I find the best TV shows or movies come from Australia mm-hmm. or England or the British. The best authentic ones. Yeah. There are so many that I got from there. Yeah, yeah. there's the culture, cultural tones in in Australia. Yes, it's so American. I got addicted to so many of the TV shows over there, and I'm like, that makes me want to live over there. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, Deborah is here with us, and she's got. Uh, she and I have been trying to connect online for a while. When I was on Zoom before Streamyard, for some reason she couldn't get on um, Zoom with me. So when I got on um, Streamyard and I said something to her, we were like jumping joy because now we can finally connect and and we can now learn something from her. As I was saying to her earlier is that life is a school but so is grief grief teaches us so much and um she's going to tell us about herself and the the wonderful things she's doing now that um that has inspired her and she's going to teach us a few things that we can learn uh even if we knew something about it sometimes as we get the brain stirring again and remembering certain things if we've forgotten about it and um, so, Deborah, tell us a little bit about what you what inspired you to do this. Teach us something, and then tell us at the end how we can find you. Thank you. And I'm going to mute myself now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone who is tuning in live <laughs> now with D and myself. My name is Deb D. So we've got a double D, triple D, it's all happening here today. Um, Thank you for tuning in and anyone catching the replay. It's a delight to be with you. So I am Zooming in, streamyarding in today from my home on the island of Tobago, which is why Dee and I found it hard to connect via Zoom because for some reason Zoom wasn't allowing that international connection when we tried to connect. But here we are now, and the reason I start here at the beautiful island of Tobago where I live now is because that's kind of like the end of the story so that you know where we're going. At the end of the story, Deborah moves to the Caribbean, marries a ruster man, builds a business called Big Life Magic, and we also have a flock of sheep that we're madly in love with. So that's the end of the story. But... The story 10 years ago was very different. I was living in Australia where I was born with my family and I was a single parent to an amazing young man named Sage. Sage Joseph is my son and he was 10, almost 11, like we had planned the birthday party. He was going to have an Iron Man birthday party because that was his favourite character. So we were in the life of... Being a single parent, he was in the life of being a 10-year-old with Asperger, growing up. And then one morning, I woke and my son Sage didn't. During the night, his heart had stopped and he had taken flight. And there was no warning at all for there was no illness. There was nothing on the outside to see. It took me 18 months before the autopsy report came back to even tell me what had happened to my son. So I then go into free fall for 18 months. I don't know why my son has died, but I know I am still alive and I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that. And about three days after Sage died, I had moved um, from where I moved, I I was with my family at my sister's place for Easter. It was actually around this time. The 10-year anniversary of Sage's death was just on the 3rd of April. And so I had left my sister's home in the mountains and returned to my home, which was now this empty house. And I kind of, you know, how it is. It's In the beginning, it's shock. 
And I knew that the first thing that I needed to do was to connect. So I sent word out to all my family and friends, please come. And, you know, something to know is in Australia, we don't sit shiver. Like I learned that when I moved to New York, the sitting of shiver after a death. I didn't know anything about that. I just knew it was time to gather people together. And so my house and my garden is filled with people. And I have this moment where I'm alone in the kitchen and my legs just can't hold me up anymore. I just kind of collapse on the kitchen floor. And there's all this life and these people wandering around, there's food, there's wine being poured, there's stories being shared. And I sit in this moment of like a thud into stillness. And what arrived there with me on the kitchen floor was curiosity. For it was clear, Sage was gone and I was still here but I wasn't sure what was going to happen next. Years before, the very first man I had ever loved, Nick, he chose to take his own life. And then seven months later, my father unexpectedly died from a heart attack. So I was 20 turning 21 and I hit two big deaths. The very first man I ever fell in love with and the very first man I ever loved, gone. And... As a 20, 21-year-old, I knew nothing about grief and processing and being with, not, not nothing like I know now. So my response at the time was light some candles, drink some beer and light a joint. And in about a year, it should be okay because I'd heard something about, you know, it takes about a year, there's five stages. That's all I knew. And everyone around me, nobody really knew. There was no guidebook. And so obviously the next step in that story is I didn't do so well. And a couple of years later, I ended up again, not being able to stand, but this time just I couldn't make myself go to work. I just couldn't get through the day. And what ended up happening was as I needed to then actually stop, surrender and understand this grief isn't going to go away. Like I had buried it so deep, I didn't even recognise that that's what was with me a couple of years later. And I started to process this grief. And the way that I processed it was the traditional, like here's some medication and now go and see the psychologist. And I hated taking the medication and I committed to going to the psychologist so that I could stop taking the medication. But I also chose within that to start to look at what are some other ways that we heal ourselves? So that was the beginning of my journey as a spiritual teacher and a student and somebody who's deeply curious about different healing modalities, about the spirit realm, the invisible world. And so I spent the next 18 years of my life discovering all of that to find myself on the kitchen floor, not knowing what's going to happen next in my journey, but knowing so much more than I did the 18 years before. And what came and sat with me with curiosity on the kitchen floor was this desire to follow the curiosity. And so the first thing that I did is I made a promise to myself. I promised myself that I would be with this grief. I wouldn't deny it like I had in the years past and go the long road. I would actually be with this. I would go to the places that were hard or scary to make my way through. And then this promise, the third promise, which is the game changer for me, the third promise I made to myself is that I would always wish the best for myself. And with that curiosity and wishing the best for myself, not knowing what's going to happen next, I got myself off the kitchen floor and I started to journey through. I journeyed through the death ritual, Sage's memorial, his burial, then all of the days that follow that, the first birthday, the first Christmas. And I found my way through and some of that was in Australia, some of that was um, in Sri Lanka. I was engaged in a peace building project using theatre and storytelling in Sri Lanka. I was already engaged in that before Sage passed, so I spent a lot of time in Sri Lanka volunteering and working with communities post-Civil War and also sitting with a whole heap of Buddhist monks and my Sri Lankan friends who were recovering from war and just stayed with this curiosity and stayed with what is possible here in this journey. And then fast forward a little bit more, I then found myself moving to New York City, 
for I was born in Australia because my father is Australian, but my mother is American. So I also have a US passport. And after the first anniversary of Sage's death, I was like, I need to land somewhere. It's time for me to start to build my life beyond this. What else is possible? So I moved myself to New York City where I lived for years and continued this exploration of really trying to understand how can I be with this? And, you know, truth be told, there were times I did grief really well. I was really attentive. I spent my time understanding. I worked with different amazing like therapists and healers. And there's also the chapters where I slipped back into denial and went swimming down the river of wine or overworked so that I didn't have to feel so much. So the journey goes on for, you know, the actual years that it takes when you're on a grief journey to actually discover what is this for me. And what I found in that is this connection between my work as a spiritual teacher and what I know about healing, and also what I now know about grief and how it affects our hearts. And I started to work on this blending of what I call magic, which for me is spiritual practice, the invisible world, what magic and grief, and found that they both have this great relationship with our heart. And so now the work that I do is, because I've now stepped into working with people, helping them understand what I learned through my journey. For Sage's death is absolutely my big life loss. I will forever be without my son while I am earthbound. And it happened. My heart shattered. It, it broke at that point. This, this, once a big life loss meets us, we actually can't deny it or change it. It has happened. It has affected our hearts. And the work that I do now is assisting people to make the transformation from whatever their big life loss is into the transformation of what their version of big life magic is. And for everyone, that's going to be different. And I also work with all of the big life losses. And to make it like accessible for people, I call them the four Ds. There's death, diagnosis, divorce, or the dream that didn't come true. And we will all be met by at least one of these Ds, if not, maybe more than one. And when they do come and affect our lives, they affect our lives in many ways, but the core of a big life loss is that it affects your heart. Your heart literally breaks. And then the process of grief or any loss transformation is how do I not only pick up those pieces but put them back together? How do I tend to them? How do I understand how to even put them back together? And then what does that mean? And so what I found in my work is what I call the energetic heart. So it's like when you're working a muscle so we have a heart muscle. Our energetic mu heart also has like a muscle. And so like let's, let's imagine this the same way we would imagine developing, say, a bicep muscle. So if you want to develop your bicep, you are going to pick up the weights and you're going to do the bicep curls. You're going to do the work. And then if you've done a good job with the weights and your little workout, the next day your bicep's going to be sore. And the reason a muscle is sore after a workout is because the muscle fibers have broken. And then our body is so amazing, it does this job of actually bringing those muscle fibers back together to heal it. And in the bringing of them back together, they strengthen. And that's how we get bigger muscles. So we work it, it hurts, they, the fibers come back together and then we get a stronger muscle. The exact same thing happens with your energetic heart. Grief or a loss comes and there's a shattering of the heart and then there's the time taken and the care taken to bring those threads back together so that you can not only mend and repair your heart 
but you are actually also creating the action of building the energetic muscle of your heart. So when we work through grief, so you know how you hear some people say grief is a great teacher or grief is a gift or, you know, I've learned so much from grief. That's their energetic heart expanding and strengthening. And when we have a stronger energetic heart, it means not only can we be resilient and work through challenges or the next grief or the next loss, it also means that that stronger, larger energetic heart has more space for love and joy which is the magic. So that's my commitment now as uh, an author, a spiritual teacher and a grief guide is supporting people to understand this framing of why do our hearts break? Our hearts break to give us the opportunity to repair them and strengthen them. And in doing so, not only do we get the expression of that expanded strengthened energetic heart in your life it's also in deep relationship to the expansion of your soul and your spirit and I find that that can help some people I'm working with who get lost inside their loss like why did this happen to me or I've been feeling this for so long I don't I don't feel like I could move on or I don't know what the next step is having that framing of this is there is actually a purpose to our heartbreak because hearts break and souls bounce. So it's it's actually this beautiful design of giving us opportunities to really deepen our understanding of ourselves and love. So it's all about the heart. So a lot of the work that I do now is working with people with heart repair. Someone may have got divorced and they're happy that they're not with their spouse anymore. It was the right decision for them. But they're not quite sure why am I sad? Well, why can I not quite move to the next part or someone with a diagnosis like all of the focus goes on to the treatments and are you okay and how's your physical body but there's also a loss of feeling safety and secure in your body there's also a loss of the life that you had before the diagnosis and the life changes that it means to you and your family and for some it's that dream that doesn't come true like I've worked with some people who they really wanted to be a mother but their body just did not support that and they needed to surrender the fact that they will not be a mother in this life. And that's a deep grief for some people. So working with this expanded sense of grief and loss that I believe one of those four Ds is going to meet us all. And rather than denying the grief like I did at 20, 21 and drinking the beer and lighting the joint and hoping that the candle wax is just going to melt it away, we can actually learn how to be with the loss and recognise that it's a big life loss. It hurts. You didn't ask for it. You didn't want it. But it has happened. And so you get to choose what you're going to do about that. And one thing that you can choose to do is work on that energetic heart because when you do, you find that it's showing you the pathway from your big life loss to your big life magic. So Dee, I have some things that I'd like to teach people about that pathway, but I also just want to open up, like, do you want to have a, want to ask me any questions or comment or? You know, um, you said a lot of stuff here that, so I wanted to bring up one thing before I forget. I didn't write it down, but it's on my head because you just mentioned something. So, you know, when we talk about the spiritual part of your heart is um, the he the healing of the heart is amazing how God created our bodies and how mm. the healing comes through that faith in him that he will heal us. And the way you described that, it was so unique of how that healing comes in. But also we have to remember the the greatest healing comes from the greatest physician that mm. helps mend our heart. Even when it's shattered because of some kind of grief, you know, because um, he promises us that he walks with us through everything. And it may not feel like he's with us, but he is with us. But I just love how you describe that you put 
put that together. She's like, amazing how you said that and taught that to us. And I don't think I'm going to forget that. But the four mm. Ds that you brought, the death, the diagnosis, the divorce, and the dreams. So three of that would be for me. The death, because I dealt with the death of my mother when I was a child. And then um, my grandmother who took us in. And then my son. Those are the mm. three greatest. I mean, there's been a lot of deaths. But those are the three greatest deaths in my family. And then the diagnosis. The diagnosis of um, a lot the you know timothy's illness and then um then my illness because you know when you deal with um anticipatory grief mm -hmm. that does not help that brings and with me it brought my cancer but then after he died my cancer came back so the grief does affect yeah. us in a big big ways you know and people don't some people don't some people don't connect that dot that to realize that you that because even when if you were going through a divorce or a broken relationship or whatever that still affects your health in a lot of ways yeah. you know so yeah i want you to i want to make sure i understood you when you use the word diagnosis are you talking about medical term or it can spiritual be whatever, term? Like, yeah well it that's a medical term really i'm i'm thinking like so for me okay the impact of diagnosis on my life was when my son Sage was diagnosed with Asperger. And it wasn't a grief for him, but it was a grief for me as a mother. I had, you know, I acknowledged yeah. I definitely heartbreak. I was sad. I was upset. Like it took me a while yeah. to process. Yeah. And I've worked yeah. with, you know, a lot of people who have had like, whether it's a cancer diagnosis or you know, like one woman recently who as an adult was diagnosed with ADHD and she didn't know. And so then there's this shock to her system around, well, who am I? You know, so, yeah, definitely medical yes. or mental health diagnosis. You know, that moment where the doctor says, here's your reality. This is what the report says. This yes. is what the test results have come back with. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because uh, my son had um, the Deshaun muscular dystrophy and he was diagnosed when he was six years old. So it was really yeah. hard to watch him, too. his body rapidly deter deteriorate into the point. Yeah. And he died like a month before his birthday, too. And did, did you say your son passed away on April 3rd? Yeah. That is my son's birthday. Yeah. So it was like yeah. the, when you said it's, that, it was like really the double D, triple D is really like we've got a lot of threads here, D. <laughs> yeah, because my son was diagnosed and he was six also. Wow. Yeah. So then the other one that you brought up, so I've never been married, so I'm not worried about the divorce. <laughs> um, was the dreams. Um mm -hmm. I I so like you're bringing up like the death of your dreams, right? Or the realization I can that probably it's say that I remember my because mm. I think that comes yes. a point where, you know, like you I know I wanted to be you know, and there, there's a point where you surrender, yeah. this isn't gonna happen. Like, you know, not all yeah, of our dreams. I think I had to surrender. I had to surrender many times because I wanted to be a school teacher and then I really wanted the body video videography and photography but then my eyes became uh, a curse <laughs> but I but then I took it to the next level and I used it and I taught the kids at church at church because we had a, you know how most everybody has boy scouts girl scouts well our church had what has what we call pathfinders but it goes through the same thing as what boy scouts and girl scouts so we don't sell cookies <laughs> and that, um, yeah and that's also like, I that is photography yeah and that's one way of explaining this transformation from big life loss to big life magic so it's like maybe the dream that yes. you had and the way you saw it didn't come true and you, you know and you be with the fact that it didn't happen and there is some heartbreak and there's either anger or yes. resentment or sadness or there's there's some forgiveness needed, whatever the lesson is for the heart. 
But when you work with it, it will actually show you the pathway to where the magic is for you. Like, and like a clear right. example of that is one woman who, you know, her body didn't make the baby that she wanted. She tried for right. years and got to the point where this isn't going to happen and then spent the next couple of years actually working on the healing and the acceptance and the letting go. And now one of her godchildren has moved in with her because the city she lives in is the best high school for this young person. And it's like a dream come true because this young person really needs my friend and my friend now gets to be the godparent who every day is making sure they're getting to school and making parenting decisions and over the next couple of years they're going to be living together with her husband. And so it is, it's like it was completely unexpected. It was never planned that this was going to happen. But beyond the healing, so was, there's big life magic. So she became like a foster parent. Exactly. And that so, was never that was never a part of the plan. It wasn't like, okay, let me heal this so that I can then do that. It's what what I've noticed in working with people is when you actually like surrender into and accept the loss and start to work with it and start to kind of expand what yes. miracles are here, what gifts are here, what can I then give back to the world? Like when you start to expand beyond the deep hurt and ouch, when you have the capacity to do that, it actually does lead you towards the magic, which is why I said the end of my story is Deborah living on a Caribbean island, married to a rust of fishermen, yeah. raising sheep did i ever think that was my reality from australia or even from my early years in new york no absolutely not do i love the life i have now yes d i do <laughs> you know god works in mysterious ways and absolutely. it's funny you know when we when we go through that loss and and our brain becomes foggy and our eyes become blind because of the grief and we, and we suddenly do not see a future. But we don't realize right there and then God has something planned for us that is beyond our depths of our dreams. And he'll put, we don't know when it's going to happen, but no. it ha happens. And when it happens, you, then you know that God, you know. Yeah. Then, then the other thing you... Oh, you brought up. So maybe I'm going, I need to go backwards because you said this before the four Ds. You said something like the wish for yourself. And I guess you were referring, wishing for yourself for those dreams and everything like that. But, you know, yeah, I, I talked to somebody else on a podcast back. And they also talked about when you said that, the first thing that came to my head is I heard, I think it was Jenny that taught us about learning to forgive yourself for mm. even to forgive yourself for grieving you know mm. so that was for some when you said wish for yourself you want to wish the best i think that's how you said it, the wish the best for yourself yeah. because you deserve it yeah and i also return to that now but that is a promise that i have continued to commit to because things like this d swimming down the river of wine and in denial hoping that the answer to my grief is at the end of the wine bottle is that wishing the best for myself yeah. no so that would be my circuit breaker when i you know like earlier days earlier new york days i have to say like i you know i got caught into the river of everything that's new york city and da, 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 and you know kind of lost my way for a little bit and then, then it was the circuit breaker of like this is not actually wishing the best for myself like staying committed mm -hmm. to, you know, the anger that comes up. Because, you know, like I find grief has yes. these buddies with, you know, anger and guilt and resentment and like a, I could go on and on. We all know it. Like grief is not isolated in just this one vibration, this one feeling. And so it's like, you know, staying connected to the anger I felt because, you know, Dee, I had this, this period of time when I was still in Australia and I was deeply angry at angels. Like I've spent my life praying to angels, right? And then yeah. I decided that it was the angels who had taken my baby away and I wanted to know why and I wanted them to give him back. 
and I was really angry at the angels. And I'll tell you what, it was deeply painful because I have a very beautiful relationship to angels. Mm -hmm. That period of time when I felt really angry at them, when I started to wish the best for myself, what I noticed was I need to channel this anger somewhere and I feel like the mm -hmm. angels can take it. You know, like I didn't want to be angry at the people around me, so I chose to be angry at the angels because it was their fault that Sage was gone because they took my baby away, right? And once I started to kind of be like, this isn't actually wishing the best for myself. I actually want the angels on my side. Right. I want to be able to continue to pray with them. And so then right. that was my circuit breaker. But I think for people on the journey, and this could even be for people on the repeat of like, because I find like you're on the journey, you might go off the journey, then you're back on the journey or, you know. But I wanted to kind of yeah. share a couple of like some, just some simple steps that you can take. I've actually got three simple steps that people can take. And this is for someone who's in either early, raw, new, coming out of the shock, like that earlier stage of grief. And it's also yes, great yes. tips that people can also use if they're further down the path of their grief, but they're kind of like either lost in their lost or they're not quite sure what's happening next. Like they, they're feeling okay, but not really better. And so the first tip is what I've already just shared, like make a promise to yourself. How will you be with this? What's going to make a difference for you? And the reason I chose, to wish the best for myself was I feared that people would pity me. Pity Deborah, oh, oh. poor Deborah, her son. And that was a great fear of mine. And I was like, why do you fear that? And I was like, well, but I fear that because I don't want to pity myself. I don't want to live a pitiful life. It's not what I want. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, wish the best yes. for myself. So the first thing would be wishing uh, sorry, making a promise to yourself and make a promise to yourself that actually means something to you, something that you can commit to. And sure, you may like, you know, step off the side on a little tangent every now and then, but it can be your anchor to bring you back onto the path, no matter how much it's hurting, mm -hmm. no matter how hard or challenging the journey is at that point in time, you have a promise that you're going to keep to yourself. And when we keep promises to ourselves, what happens to us as humans is we build confidence. So when you keep a promise, you are building oh, yes. your confidence, which means yes. you're building confidence in I can do this. I can be with this grief and find my way from this big life loss to this big life magic. So you're not oh, only yes. keeping the confidence, you're also building your confidence. Now, the second thing that I invite people to do. Makes sense. When you feel like you're in need, like when you feel like you're, and I, my grief needs something, I actually advise people, do not first reach to another person. Grief is very intimate. Say that again. When, when you know, when you hit like, because grief has these all these different chapters and journeys and you hit this one day where it's really hurting and you want someone to help you. You're wanting to reach to a person who's going to help take the pain away or tell you it's going to be okay, which is okay to do that, but to actually be with what this intense, exquisite experience is offering you, I recommend to people to not actually reach to a person first but to reach to either nature or art. So this was a big healer for me particularly in the first few months after Sage's death, is each day I would walk out and be with the trees and be with the river because I noticed there with being with nature, I could completely unfold because the trees never mm -hmm. asked me how I was. The trees never asked me if I needed anything. They were just there breathing with me. If I needed support, I could lean her back on a tree trunk if i needed to let something go mm -hmm. i could put my feet in the water and watch the water run over like it gave me a relationship with mm -hmm. me and my heart it gave yes. me the time space for me to process it 
And so for some people, it's not going to be nature. It's going to be art. It's going to be music or drawing or painting or photography or a day that it really, really hurts choosing to go to a museum or an art gallery and just to, like, allow your senses to lead the way. So in a sense, than, hmm. like in a sense, you're distracting your, your... No, it's not. It's absolutely not. Would that not, be in a sense distracting it or is that... No, it's not distracting. It's allowing So then it going out is... So it's yeah, allowing okay. to be uh, that's channeled with you, you know, so that you can actually, so it's like, yeah. you know, like if you put on a song, um, the, you know, we all have songs that we put on that make us feel happy. We have songs that, that you know, they're going to remind us of a memory yeah. and they might make us feel melancholy. Like, so it might be like sometimes I do that. Sometimes I'm like I can feel the grief wants some attention. I can feel it building in my body. So sometimes I will go walk to the beach here because I'm lucky. I'm I'm directly connected to nature, but also sometimes when that's not available to me, like the times when I'm spending time up in New York, I have certain songs D that I will play because they help me to connect to the feeling and let it out. It's like the nature and the art help you to channel what's coming through your heart, rather than reaching for another person. Because sometimes we definitely need other people in the process. Absolutely. But I think learning how to be with the grief with yourself and how do you channel it through, it's very difficult on your own, but when we're connected to trees or a river or the mountain or a beautiful landscape or art or music, it can feel like they you can breathe with, you can be supported by. And it takes a little bit of practice, but it's an absolutely beautiful practice when you get into it. Like I was there this morning, Dee, just late December, on the 29th of December, my beloved elder sister, Kathy surrendered her cancer journey. So my heart is broken again. You know, I'm in that raw of grief and I could feel it getting tense. So I stopped my beach walk and sat at, at the beach, moved my playlist to one of my Kathy songs, just mm -hmm. listened to it, allowed myself to cry, allowed myself to see her face in my mind's eye because I needed a moment to be with her. And I also needed a moment just to be with my heart and allow it to be so I could carry on with my day because I've had a full Friday, you know, and it just... So you, it gave yourself, so you gave yourself permission to grieve, but you gave yourself permission to grieve on your... Yeah. And not only on my terms, but supported by nature or art because I believe it makes yes. a difference. Yeah. And then the third thing I advise people to do is if you're finding it hard to be with the grief, then just create little moments, create little ritual moments for yourself where it might be the five minutes in the morning with your cup of coffee, you're going to write in your journal, or if you're not a journaling person, it might be in the evening you're going to allow yourself to say some prayers and think about it and feel about it. But to do this practice as a way, almost like as we would like working a bicep or doing a yoga practice or a meditation practice, where mm -hmm. each day you want to expand it a little bit more. Because a lot of people fear that if I actually surrender to this grief, I'm going to go down the black hole and maybe I'll never come back out and I don't know what's down there. It's scary and I, I don't want to go. So that's a lot of kind of like people resisting actually being in the river with grief, being embraced by grief and learning from grief is because it's scary and it's going to hurt. You can't deny that. It's going to hurt. And yes. so I advise people, like, just, yes. just make a little space. And then maybe a week later you make a little bit more space and then maybe a month later you've got some more space so you can build your capacity mm -hmm. to be with you. you don't have to go from zero to 100. You don't have to go from denial, I can't, I can't process this now, I just have to deal with all of the other, like the divorce papers or all of the, the death notices and all of the legal stuff that happened because we can very easily distract ourselves. But it comes to that point where the, all the distractions are gone and it's you and your heart and what are you going to do about that? And then it's tricky because you haven't developed this capacity to be with the deep, deep loss 
it's, it hurts. No one wants to do it. <laughs> so just easing yourself in. Yeah. Zero to 100 wow. never helped. Hey, so you're going to be part of the Global Grief Conference that was starting in two I weeks, am. right? I am. I'm speaking on the Friday what morning. What day you speak on? I'm speaking on the Friday morning. Oh, Friday. Okay. Yeah. I think it's it's 9 a.m. my time, so it's 11 Mountain Time, 9 a.m. Eastern Time on the Friday oh. morning. Yeah, Usually, and I'm going to be mm. – oh, no, maybe it's yeah. earlier than that. I think it's – yeah. So yeah, I think it's 11 o'clock your time, 9 o'clock his time, so because he's behind. Yeah. And I think you're ahead. Right, right. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Because like right now it's it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, you're right. You're right, dear. I had it the wrong okay, way around. So I look forward yeah, to that because I'm gonna I am going to do my ultimate best to attend as classes because this is just awesome. And we do take notes because how helping to write it down helps also engrave it into your brain so that you remember stuff. And yeah, again, I have to say because my age sometimes I forget to do that, but I'm glad I did because that I learned so much from you today. It really, really, really you inspired me. Um, you gave me an idea, so I want to make sure I didn't forget asking you. So, we already talked about that. We could, yeah, you had some major losses. Yeah spouse then your father then your son the three men of your life yeah and then and then recently your sister right yeah that's just awesome mm. so tell yeah. us where we can, tell yeah, us where we can say, find you yeah so you obviously big life magic so biglifemagic.com or Big Life Magic on Instagram or Big Life Magic on YouTube. But the one thing I, do, I really want to direct people towards, and I actually have one right here, Dee, is my book, A Series of Surrenders. Oh. So in this book is oh. story, this is the story of all three of those deaths. It chronicles the my lover, my father, and my son. My lover. Uh, and and it explores the journey. What is it called took. again? And, and it, it's called a series of surrenders. Series of surrenders. Yeah, you can buy the paper okay, back. Order or that. You can also get the audio book, and I narrate it for you. So if you want to hear my voice telling the story, you can get it the audio book version as well. Um, but in this, in this, I like to get in the book. Yeah, I'm a book reader too. Because I, I like that. me, if I see something that you inspired me, I have to underline it or highlight it or circle a certain word to help me remember. Audio is nice, but I'm a textbook scribbler. <laughs> yeah. That's how it's yeah. me learn. So, um, yeah. so I also like uh, like you can wow. find a series of surrenders on like all the way all the ways you can purchase books. But I, I want to direct people towards, yes. I have a special link. I don't know how to share it. Maybe I'll share it with you later, Dee, and we can share it with the audience. It's the bit, it's bit.ly backslash a series of surrenders, the book. I don't know. Let me see if I can put it in the chat here. I wonder if I can do that. What oh, there is it, it again? Is. I just put it in the chat. It's bit.ly, B-I-T, full stop L-Y. You'll see it in the chat. A series of surrenders, the okay. book. The reason I, I direct people to that link is because you can purchase the book in any way that you wish through that link, but also connected to that link is a special meditation that I have um, recorded and it's called Embraced by Grief. So that part where I was talking about like just sitting with and just sitting with and just sitting with, this meditation is um, has been shared by me for that purpose of that time when you are actually sitting with grief, when you're going to be embraced by grief. Because in my world, grief to me is a big, beautiful angel. And grief has these big, big, beautiful wings 
and you can come sit into the lap of grief and the wings will come in and hold you and tend to your heart. So I have a meditation where you are invited to sit in the lap of grief and to be embraced by grief. And the way to get that meditation is through that link, the bit.ly link. So I'll make sure that I share it with you beyond this okay. also, D, and we can post it around and let people know. Um, but a series of surrenders you can find on my website or, or all the ways you buy books. But if you're interested in that particular meditation, that's going to be through that, that bit.ly link. Wow. Mm. Mm. I can hyperlink that and, and save the, the, the link. Yeah. Um, my mind just went back. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. Uh, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for, for you being here and for sharing all this information. I hope the many people who some, you know, it's recorded so people can go back and listen to it again. But it, you really um, inspired and helped me to understand a little bit better how the heart and the mending of the heart and, um, you know, because I know a lot of parents, I hate to use this word, but I know there's a lot of parents who are, in a sense, stuck. And I hate using that word because they yeah. don't, they don't know how to get out. They don't know how to get help. And um, it's, and a lot of people, I'm trying to figure out how to say this, offending anyone. I like how you talked about your the angels and how you were so um, connected with your angels and how you, and how you were angry. So I noticed this: you were I'm angry really at the angels. <laughs> really but angry you, at. But were you angry at? <laughs> but were you angry at God? I I had a moment of being really angry at God, but that came later. That came okay. later. So, that's, so that's people in the book. know it's okay to be angry at God and the angels. Yeah. Um, it's, not, it's not a sin to be angry yeah. at God or the angels. It's what you do with that anger. So there are some people who have so much hatred and revenge. They want to, they do something that is, that does become a sin. You know, like if you go and kill somebody or hurt somebody or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Or even, yeah. But but you somehow, even if you're angry, you still somehow took that and took and did something good. And, and that's what makes your healing process because instead of doing the bad, bad which is to do, you want to turn it around and do something in memory of our child. Yeah. Doing yeah. this book, doing this course, doing this, you're doing this in memory of your son, Sage, and in the memory of your father, and in memory of your spouse, and also, because and these were the people that meant the most to you. But also for my heart, yeah. too. I think the other thing that happens for people yeah. in a lost journey is they're the one left behind, or they're the one post diagnosis, or yes. they're the one after divorce. What does this mean for my life? You know, like this, this actually brings me great yes. joy, working with people, helping them yes. to transform this pain and loss that they have, and then watching when they create these be these new chapters in their life. Like it, it brings yes. me great joy. Yes. Like I never yes. put up my hand as a kid and said, pick me, I'll be the grief guide. Like I, that, I'll do that for a job. Like I never did yeah. that. But I actually <laughs> find that yeah. I get a lot of joy out of being a grief guide and i you know and, and i think that all that be, I, I think i think god gave you those gifts and the talent because you surrendered you surrendered your grief you surrendered your anger you surrendered everything to him and forever you, you are trust you put your trust in me this is what i'm going to do to help bless you because i see you want to mm -hmm. help people I see you want to bless people. I 
to you and the people. It makes you a servant of God, in a sense, when we surrender and we acknowledge and we, we give us to grieve. You know, some people are afraid to grieve because they, they get judged. And so if they go into their little corner or they yeah. go like, well, you, you know, your glasses of wine and your joint and stuff like that, you know, because that's how society teaches us how to deal with it, yeah. you know. But instead, you found a way to turn it around. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you mm -hmm. for being here. And thank you for yeah. sharing. Yeah. And I look Pleasure. forward to hearing from you, hearing you at the Global Grief Conference, which is, starts in two weeks from today. Um, it is. You said Two you on Friday, today. right? Friday morning. Friday. Yeah. And Friday. April. Yeah, April twenty eighth through April thirtieth, and um, it's going to be three full, blessful, wonderful days of learning so much from each other. And I'm thankful that you have become part of um, our network to help educate people and even educate us coaches. <laughs> We're all teaching each other new things, and it's wonderful. Yeah. All that um, stuff to learn. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for the invitation, Dee. It's been a delight. And you know what? I want to invite you back again because I'm sure you have much more to teach. This fall, you can come back and teach us something new, you know? Um, because, sure. this, like we said, life and grief teaches us so much. So yeah. thank you. So this is, yeah. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and for being, um, this has been so awesome. Uh, this is Dee Bird with Unplugged Grief Ministries. And we will be back next week with um, Dorian Johnson. He um, has an amazing story of what he's doing to help, actually to help men with their grief, you know. And it's um, it's nice that I'm seeing that a little bit more support groups like Tony's and um, oh, I forgot who the who else is doing. It's a few other ones that are doing support groups for men who are grieving because we all know men men are the ones that are the hardest to admit when it comes to grief. You know, they they don't want to acknowledge it, but they're hiding it, and they hide it unfortunately behind the wrong substance you know so anyway thank you for deborah for being part of this um, thank you broadcast and i look forward to having you coming back and i look forward to hearing you speak two weeks so mm -hmm. have a wonderful weekend and oh you're speaking on sunday with tony aren't you i am that's so right on <laughs> yeah. So we're going to have to also share that when he does that. Yeah. So yeah. That's good. Good promotion there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Have a good weekend. Don't party too much down under. I'm still going to call it down under no matter what. <laughs> yeah, I am deep in the creek. I know so it's I not Australia. Answer. It's not Australia, but it's still Caribbean and it's still nice, you know. So, yeah. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Dee. It doesn't want to end.